Um, welcome to the Petaluma Library. I'm going to do a 15 second commercial about the library. We have some flyers on the back table about some of our upcoming programs, including our upcoming um, Friends of the Library book sale. But I'm not here today to talk about library programs because this is the first time we have had the Petaluma Museum come to our side of town. Um, just, just off the um, off the top of my head, about 10 years ago, we started going over to the old library and doing story times behind the library on that deck out there. And so it's really exciting that today, Joe from the Petaluma Museum has come all the way across town to give you a program from the museum itself. So Joe, Joe Noriel, right? Yes. Noriel, yes. The president of the Petaluma Museum, and he's going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mentioned just for the record and my term has actually expired as president uh, an unbelievable organization and I'm so proud to be a part of it uh, happy to be here today I'm glad to see everybody um, first yeah big thanks to the Petaluma library we're so appreciative that they uh, let us use this great facility uh, welcome to Petaluma community access always a great supporter of the community thank you very much fun topic today uh, you know it was literally 224 years ago in April uh, that this event took place. You know, I mean, what a clash of characters between, you know, Bly and Fletcher Christian, and, you know, that course would, you know, literally live on forever in, in that famous story. And I know it's a subject that has already fascinated me, you know, and I've always wondered, well, what happened to the mutineers? And we know so much about the story itself, uh, but what happened to the mutineers? And fortunately, we'll get the full story today. Uh, Dr. Robert Kirk, he's uh, so many great things, but President of the World Affairs Council, uh, educator, amazing fellow, uh, PhD, and author of the book, The Tan Island, The Bounty Mutineers and Their Descendants. So we welcome Bob here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on uh, August the 7th, 2006, I woke up. And I said to myself, I'm going to write a history of Pitcairn Island. So this is the result. And uh, of course, it has to do with the Bounty Mutiny, because it's where the Bounty Mutineers went. There have already been 2,000 books and articles about the island, or about the mutiny. So why another one? Because this is the only one that brought uh, uh, the story up to date. And let me give you a little bit, bit of background. Actually, I'll pass this around. if you glance at it. Uh, it's, it's being sold on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, so you can buy it online. I have three books about the South Pacific. Uh, another one is uh, called History of the South Pacific since 1513. Third one is called Paradise Past, Transformation of the South Pacific, 1520 to 1920. And the trouble with writing three books like that is I stay home the entire month of December waiting for the Nobel Prize Committee to call, <laughs> which they never have. But, uh, at least it keeps me home at Christmas time, so that's nice. Uh, the story behind all of this, and uh, the story behind all of this has to do with these three stamps. I am a stamp collector, and I was a stamp collector as I grew up. And one day in junior high school, a kid traded me these three stamps for something. And I thought, these are really interesting, because I tried to get a stamp or two from every country in the world. I'd never heard of this place in my life. And who in the world was this guy? It says John Adams in his house. Well, that wasn't the second, uh, second president of the United States, and if so, he wasn't out in the Pacific, so what's the story? Well, this led to, of course, reading the uh, Bounty Trilogy by Nordhoff and Hall, which were bestsellers in the 1930s, and also to seeing the, the movie, the 1935 version of Mutiny on the Bounty, and later on, uh, as I progressed through life, two later versions in 1962 and 1984. And, uh, I, I never lost my interest in Pitcairn Island and the Bounty Mutiny. So in the mid-1980s, uh, is my wife Barbara, uh, she's famous for saying, other ladies get to remodel the house, he makes me go around the world. 
<laughs> so in the mid 1980s, uh, we were in uh, at Yale University, where I was given a scholarship to study British imperialism. And the professor there, Robin Winks, told Barbara and me, this is a cocktail party, I had two cocktails, and he said, I'm going to lecture going across the Pacific on a cruise ship. I'd never heard of such a thing. And I said, are you going to Pitcairn Island? He said, yes. Pitcairn Island. I told, did I tell you I had two cocktails? Pitcairn Island. I'd give my right arm to go to Pitcairn Island. Totally forgot about that. Totally forgot about that. A few months later, I get a call from Lindblad Cruise Lines, as Bob Kirk, you bet it is. And you and your wife are going to take a free six-week trip across the Pacific, and you're going to give the lectures. Well, what the heck did I know? I mean, I had gone waiting at Santa Cruz. That's about all I really knew about the Pacific. Well, that's not true. I didn't know some more. And uh, I ended up reading quickly 43 books and writing lectures, and off we went on the greatest adventure of our lives. We did go to Pitcairn Island. We went in 1986, and we went again later on in 2002, and um, enjoyed the people there very much and enjoyed the history of it. So in 2006, I decided I'm going to write this book. So I had lectures that I, oh, uh, that first cruise led to 63 more cruises in various places, a lot on the South Pacific, uh, of lecture on cruise ships. So uh, that's why she says he makes me go around the world was the truth. So uh, I realized that uh, there was a Pitcairn library at Pacific Union College in Anglin, an hour from my house. And the reason for that is that they're Seventh-day Adventists, as are the people on Pitcairn Island, Seventh-day Adventists. So uh, that was very useful to me. And the director of the library told me where I could uh, place my book. I sent the book off to the publisher, and within three weeks, I had a contract on my desk. What could be better? So there's the book, as you can see, coming around. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, I'm going to tell you this, this story. There are three stamps, uh, and there's a picture of Pitcairn Island, and the guy uh, uh, sort of enwrapped in ship's ropes there is Fletcher Christian who's going to overthrow Captain Bly, as we're going to see. So our story begins not in the South Seas whatsoever, but in the Caribbean sugar plantations. And the reason for that is that uh, this was huge British enterprise. Places like uh, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, uh, Jamaica, huge sugar plantations. Sugar was the Let's see what is current today, the computer industry or the dot com of uh, the 1700s. So sugar was big. And these were very, very wealthy British people who were represented in Parliament by themselves. They represented themselves or a family member. So they had a lot of power. They were a huge lobby. And what they wanted was cheap food for their slaves. And the reason for that was that by the 1780s, the economy wasn't, uh, the sugar economy wasn't very good. British sugar exports were getting uh, uh, hurt by uh, those from French Santo Domingo, which is today Haiti, uh, which uh, produced sugar more, uh, more cheaply. So they wanted cheap food. And they heard about something that had been found in the South Seas. Here's your slaves in the plantations. And that thing was called red fruit. And that had been reported as early as 1690 by William Dampier, the pirate, and later more famously by James Cook, who made three voyages to the South Pacific. And uh, uh, he, he, he reported that, uh, and uh, the biologist who, or botanist who went with him, Sir Joseph Banks, this was wonderful stuff. You take this loaf off of the tree, you put it in an oven, and out comes bread. And it's easy to grow, it's just that you need some tropics to do it in. Well, West Indies were tropics. So how do we get this bread fruit from the South Pacific to the West Indies? Well, this is a, a good time to do it. We're talking about 1789. Britain and France are uh, at peace a rare interlude of peace before the French Revolution and Napoleon. 
the uh, war of uh, the American Revolution was over. In fact, Washington was inaugurated just about uh, within a couple of weeks of the time of the uh, mutiny itself. And uh, so this was a very good time to do it. So they're going to go off and try to find, uh, try to get breadfruit. Now, what did they know about the Pacific? Uh, of course, people from Japan and China had known about the Pacific for a long time, and the Polynesians who lived there had discovered it. So if I ever say discover, you should uh, ask Barbara to kick me because uh, I should say found. It was the Polynesians who discovered these islands, not Captain Cook or any, or, or any of our mutineers. Well, it was Magellan, the first European, who entered the South Pacific from the west in 1521 and then sailed uh, over to uh, the Philippines to get killed by natives there. But his ships made it around back to Spain. After that, not too much was going on. Uh, a couple of expeditions in the 1600s uh, by the Spanish went to the Solomon Islands and to the Marquesas. That was about it. 1700s more early 1700s more, some more uh, British explorers, some French explorers. And then in 1767, Captain Samuel Wallace discovered Tahiti. Paradise on Earth. What could be better? Plenty of food, health-giving fruit all over the place, vegetables growing on the ground, pigs running around, fat pigs to slaughter, and the women <laughs> and these girls wore uh, 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 a clothing that uh, made out of the fruitless mulberry tree that would disintegrate when it hit the water. So it all had to come out off when they went swimming. <laughs> and they were desperate, as I'll tell you later on, for nails because they had no iron. So they would do anything. Well, that's a story for later. <laughs> so here's our breadfruit. What could be better? So the British government, the, the uh, uh, so-called plantocracy, that is the planters with so much power in Parliament, asked the British government, please, 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 can we send somebody to get breadfruit to bring it to the Caribbean? Well, King George III really favored this. And this was, uh, yes, the same dude who lost the 13 colonies. But uh, he did believe in science, and he favored this largely. And he told the government to buy a ship, a uh, coastal coaling ship called the Bethia. And they changed the name to Bounty, because it was the bounty of the king, which was going to bring breadfruit to the slaves in the West Indies. So now what we need to do is buy a 91-foot, 220-ton boat, rechristened the bounty, and we're going to put aboard 47 men. And that will include Captain Bly, uh, who had had a lot of experience uh, in the South Pacific. He had uh, sailed uh, to the South Pacific with Captain Cook on the last voyage, where Cook was killed in the Hawaiian Islands in 1778. And uh, he was a masterful navigator. <coughs> he was going to have no Marines aboard. Now, a Marine is somebody like a policeman on a ship who keeps order. But there wasn't room for the Marines because you had to bring gardeners from Kew Garden in London to pot the breadfruit. You had to bring the breadfruit plants. And to keep them warm in the high altitudes, you're going to have to have a wood stove and a lot of wood. So conditions would be so crowded, there's going to be no Marines. Now Bly, well, we'll get to Bly here in just a second. He's the whole cause of the problem. Here's Captain Bly. He had a terrible mouth. He was not physically cruel. He did some floggings, but far less than Captain Cook or Captain Vancouver and a lot of others, far less. And But uh, he was a person who just Bloated all the time. Terrible, terrible verbal temper. And then everything passed. So five minutes later, he'd invite you to dinner. You know, it was just, 
uh, it, he, just something he had to get off of his chest. And uh, he was made, uh, here it says Captain Bly, he was captain of the ship, but his rank was lieutenant. And as lieutenant, he was paid 70 pounds for this, 70 pounds a year. He should have been getting 300 pounds for a voyage of this description. The other thing was that his orders to sail were delayed until December 23rd, which meant that he got to the Strait of Magellan much too late, a little bit past the height of the southern summer to get through. So he tried for a month to get through, couldn't do it, had to go back. Uh, and he was, uh, and he didn't like his rank. He thought he should have uh, done much better. He was married with uh, four daughters uh, who were living in London while he was gone. So off Captain Bly goes. Now, for the crew, we got 4,600 people, or 46 other people. Why would they sign up for an expedition like this? Did I mention the nails and the girls? And the fact that their uh, tappa cloth would come off if it disintegrated, so they took it off when they got in the water. So that was one reason, because they heard stories back in England about these wonderful Tahitian girls who didn't have the Judeo-Christian concept of sin, no such thing. Also, because they get three square meals a day. Now, where does that saying come from? Uh, rather than use round crockery dishes like you and I do, uh, they used square wooden boards, easy to store, and if, you, if it falls on the floor, so what? Uh, because of the storm or somebody drops it, so what? It's not going to break. So to get three meals a day would be served on a square plate, three square meals a day. So if you were to leave now, you've learned something, haven't you? <laughs> and uh, the other thing is that a lot of people in England didn't get three meals a day. These guys got at least 4,000 calories a day. Now, we'd be blimps if we did that, but uh, they worked hard. I mean, really, really hard on these old sailing ships of 4,000 calories a day. And they had a beer allotment and a rum allotment. So, let's see. We got the girls, got the nails, we got the beer, the rum, three square meals a day. <coughs> Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? This was the only volunteer uh, group of sailors ever to, probably in that whole decade or century, to go anywhere with the British Navy. That was a terrible life. Most of these guys had to be shanghaied, had to be drugged in uh, seaside bars and put aboard. But these guys really, really, really wanted to go. So it should have been just a wonderful, wonderful cruise uh, with no problems at all. But this guy's going to cause the problems. <coughs> so here's how they're going to go. Uh, look at the red line and follow it as far as Tahiti, not as far as uh, Tofua, as far as Tahiti. So they come from England. It's going to take them 11 months to get there. They're going to get stalled trying to get through the Strait of Magellan at the bottom of South America, unsuccessful. Uh, they'll uh, switch uh, plans and go to Cape Town, spend some time there revittling, and then off they go around the bottom of uh, Australia and New Zealand to uh, Tahiti. And here's Fletcher Christian. He had sailed with Bly on three occasions. His, uh, Bly's wife's family was friends of Christian's family. And Christian uh, came from the solid middle class. In fact, his brother is a judge. So he was a person probably better educated than Bly. But he was a friend of Bly's. In those days, nobody joined the Navy. He didn't join the British Navy. He joined an officer. And as he got promoted, you did too. After this voyage, uh, Bly could have expected to be put in command of a larger ship or several ships. Would have been promoted certainly to captain if he had done this right. Christian would have been become a permanent lieutenant. Here he's only a temporary lieutenant. But he's the uh, intimate and uh, associate of Bly. They've known each other. Well, he's going to cause, he's going to cause this thing. So they reach Tahiti. Oh my gosh, what a paradise on earth. There's some warfare going on from time to time, but not too much. And uh, it, it, everybody's beautiful and they're tolerant of one another and uh, 
there's not, uh, there has been some cannibalism in the past, but no evidence of it now. An occasional human sacrifice, but what can you do? That happens in Chicago 500 times a year. So uh, it, it's really a nice place, really a paradise. And uh, lots and lots of people and beautiful people, no disease, no disease until the Europeans are going to show up and they will bring in all kinds of diseases. And the crewmen made many friends. And Bly berated them, but he didn't keep them busy. While all this is going on, for six months, 24 weeks actually, of potting 1,015 breadfruit plants, three men tried to desert to Teddy Aroa Atoll, later on bought by Marlon Brando as its home. Some other men tried to cut the uh, main line or the main uh, chain of the ship to set it adrift. These guys obviously didn't want to go back to England, didn't want to get back on that awful boat where uh, you have uh, very little fresh food, terrible food. In fact, ship's biscuit was what people ate a lot. And a seasoned sailor would take the ship's biscuit and he'd bang it on the railing of the ship. And if no maggots fell out, he'd realize it's inevitable and he'd throw it overboard. Or maybe he'd carve something out of it. So this is what people were eating. It's pretty grim. So they didn't really want to go back uh, if they could stay there. Some of them didn't. So on April the 28th, 1789, the mutiny takes place. And what happens, so, uh, according to just about everybody's testimony, is this. A couple of days before, they had gone to another island in the Tonga Islands. They had left Tahiti, they're on their way home, gone to another island and gotten a bunch of coconuts. So Bly had a pile of coconuts outside of his cabin. And a couple were missing in the morning. So Bly comes out, where are my bloody coconuts? And uh, he called in uh, uh, Christian and a few other men. He says, I want my coconuts. Who's stolen my coconuts? And Christian says, I, I, you know, I got thirsty. I ate a coconut. I hope you don't accuse me of theft. And Bly said, I do. You're a bloody thief. And uh, we don't like thieves on the ship. You're a bloody thief. Well, that pretty much could not only ruin a man's career in the Navy, because there were uh, just a couple, of, there were two or three things that you could get hanged for, court-martialed and hanged. One of those was theft. Last thing you wanted aboard was a thief on a ship. So uh, this worried Christian a lot. He realized his career was over. He's not going to get promoted. He's not going to stay in the Navy. And also, he may get court-martialed and hanged for theft. You know, a bloody coconut. But. Whether that was his main motivation or maybe he was just totally fed up. It wasn't to get back to the women, although that, was, that would have been nice, because that's not what he tried to do. He was going to take a hatch off of the deck and use it to float to the nearby island of Tofua. And in fact, we should have a, uh, there's our uh, picture of Tofua. Barbara and I have been there and seen Bly's cave. He's going to float to Tofua and uh, get away from uh, and get away from Bly altogether. And a couple of men on the ship says, "Don't do that. Uh, a lot of men are, are, agree with you. Uh, why don't you take the ship, and we'll put Captain Bly off in a boat." So here's Captain Bly. He's going to put into be put into this boat. It's a 23-foot launch, uh, fit for 15 men but uh, there's going to be 19 of them. So all of these men were loyal to Captain Bly. There were seven men who professed loyalty to Bly, they didn't want a mutiny, who there's no room for them. So they stayed on the ship. So they're innocent guys, but they're taken off who the bounty. Uh, Bly is now going to go off on a 3,018 mile voyage to the nearest European settlement that he knows of. And that would be in what we call today Indonesia, uh, and on the island of Timor. Some mutineers actually went with Christian 
because they wanted to return to the women and who could blame them. Well, this is one of the most exciting stories ever to be uh, ever, ever to occur in history. And th uh, five movies were made of this. Two of them were earlier Australian movies, 1916 Entirely Lost, 1924 uh, uh, Seen Occasionally. But the big one, the first big one, won the Academy Award in 1935 with Charles Lawton as a uh, really irascible Captain Bly. And, uh, and Clark Gable, of course, is Fletcher Christian. This was really an inaccurate film, but it was good. And it kind of made Lawton's reputation. And people ever since says, you're a real Captain Bly as a synonym for a nasty type of film. And then in 1962, Marlon Brando and Trevor Howard. Brando, of course, is Christian. Brando fell in love with Tahiti and fell in love with one of the women who was in the movie. Uh, married her, bought the island of Teddy Aroa, to which three mutineers had tried to desert, and uh, didn't live happily ever after, but uh, that's another story. And that's a pretty good movie, it's uh, not too bad. The best one was uh, Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins in 1984. This is fairly historically accurate. If you're going to see one for accuracy, that's a good one to see. What did you see last night, Joe? Uh, this one. Yeah, that's the best one. So Bly now sailed for over 3,000 miles to Timor in this little launch. At first they tried to go on shore at Tofu, Tofua, Tofu, I must remember, Tofua, but uh, the natives attacked them and killed one of them, and they didn't stop at any island after that. They went through the Fiji Islands, a lot of other islands. Stopped nowhere until they got to the Great Barrier Reef, and then went on to Tofua, half dead. Half dead, but every one of them survived. Half dead, but survived. <coughs> so they got here to uh, Timor in the East Indies, and there was a, a Dutch settlement of Kupang, and there the governor gave them uh, hospitality. Bly, on the credit of the British government, went aboard a, a Dutch ship, got back to England, went directly to the Admiralty in London, uh, reported the mutiny. They had to court-martial him for having a mutiny, which they did. He said, I was perfect, I did nothing wrong, uh, it was the women of Tahiti which enticed my men, and uh, I am above reproach in all respects, and I was just a picture of loving fatherly kindness to the crew. So they promoted him. Later on, uh, he'll get a mutiny against twice more. He'll get exonerated uh, once as governor of uh, New South Wales in Australia, and every time he has a mutiny, uh, he gets exonerated, and they promote him again. So he died as a vice admiral. <coughs> he would have probably been a full admiral or admiral of the fleet if he hadn't died and if he had had a couple more mutinies. But he was a very good navigator. Not a good commander of men, but a good navigator. So this was uh, probably the most heroic open boat voyage of all time. Drinking rainwater, eating fish. They uh, had a little bit of wine and fresh water with them. But, uh, and a little bit of food, but not too much. Uh, Bly rationed this out among them so that uh, they actually got to their destination. Once they're in Kupang, uh, the rest of the crew who got left there by Bly had to go off to Batavia, the capital of the East Indies, which is now called Jakarta. And the Dutch called it the queen of the seas, but most people called it the queen of disease. And when they were there, they were bitten by mosquitoes, uh, bad water, everything like that. And uh, several of them died, and a few got home. And we'll get, uh, we'll get back to, so they got home safely enough, but not all of them. So, uh, wait a minute. Where am I here? Oh, so the Admiralty decided to send a ship to apprehend the mutant. This is going to be 1790, 
and the ship is going to be called the Pandora. And they're going to be put in charge of the, they're going to put in charge of the ship, Captain Edward Edwards, one of the most notorious, vicious martinets of all history, a man who simply followed orders without any kind of human uh, empathy or sympathy whatsoever. And he's going to apprehend as many of these mutineers as he can. Well, this was an expensive proposition to send the HMS Pandora out there with another ship uh, as well. And, uh, but they wanted to deter all future mutinies. So the Pandora sailed to Tahiti, obviously. That's where they're going to look for these guys. Uh, what had happened to the, the bounty? <coughs> The bounty uh, after the mutiny had sailed to the island of Tubai, which is south of Tahiti and the Austro Islands. Tried to make a settlement there, chased off by natives, went back to Tahiti. There's 25 mutineers left on the bounty, 25 of them. So 18 of them will elect to stay on Tahiti. 18 of them are going to stay. Nine of them will sail off and find the turn out. Of those 18 on Tahiti, two of them get killed. They get into native wars, trying to become native chiefs. They get killed by the Tahitians. 16 of them are now apprehended by Edwards on the Pandora. And they're put into a box, great big box, on board the Pandora, which of course they're going to call what? Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> so here's uh, uh, the mother of a small baby uh, uh, born of uh, one of the mutineers uh, saying goodbye to daddy as he sails on. Edwards was not only a vicious martinet, but he was a terrible sailor. And he wrecks on the Great Barrier Reef. Of course, Captain Cook had done the same thing. And there, uh, these guys are left in Pandora's box until finally somebody drops a key through the door and uh, four of the mutineers die, four of the captives died. They're not all mutineers, some are among the seven loyalists. Four captives died and the rest of them were saved. All in all, uh, 35 men died on this wreck on the Great Barrier Reef. Finally, see the box there on deck. This is pretty bad. So four of the captives died. And uh, here we have our map of uh, where the bounty went, which is the red line, where Bly went from Tofua to Kupang, which is the black line, and the yellow line is where the Pandora is going to go. I'm sorry, where the bounty is going to go. Uh, going to Tubai and later on to Pitcairn Island. So here's Pitcairn Island. That's a pretty good map. It shows you where it is. It's about 4,000 miles from New Zealand, 3,800 mile, miles from uh, Chile. It had been discovered in 1767, I say to discovered, been found in 1767 uh, by Captain Carter Ray of the Swallow. He was unable to land as much as he wanted to because he needed vegetables to prevent scurvy. But uh, the surf was so raging, it was raging so hard, he couldn't get in. He couldn't get a boat in. So all he did was to chart it. But he charted it wrong. He was off by 200 miles. So let's see, here we got a small island, mischarted entirely that nobody's going to, in the whole world, is going to know about. And it has a raging surf so bad that people can't get in. It's also, uh, and uh, Fletcher Christian found out about this island by reading a book in Bly's library after he took the bounty. Uh, and a book called Hawksworth Voyages, so he's going to go look for this. So let's see. We got our 18 men who have been apprehended, uh, or 16 men apprehended and taken back to England, except four of them have died on the Great Barrier Reef, so that leaves us 14. Uh, when they get back to England, six of them are convicted by court-martial of mutiny, 
Uh, two of them are uh, pardoned, uh, uh, three of them are pardoned, and three are hanged. And they're hanged in Portsmouth Harbor aboard His Majesty's ship. And people from the town of Portsmouth and all the surrounding communities come out to watch the hanging. What better entertainment could there be in 1792 than that? No television, a good hanging. What could be better? Bring your lunch. So that's what they did, and that's so that's what happened to those folks. Now we've still got uh, nine mutineers left, and they've sailed off in the bounty with uh, without Captain Bly, but with twelve Tahitian women. Did I tell you about the women? Well, mm -hmm. I did. Didn't I? Twelve Tahitian women, but unbeknownst to them, or maybe beknownst to them, six Tahitian males. Now, my, my wife's a math major, so let's see, Barbara, help me out here. We got nine mutineers and six Tahitian males, that's 15, and 12 females. That's a problem. <laughs> that's a math problem. 15 males and 12 women. We're going to see what happens, what, what comes out of that. So off they're going to go to uh, Pitcairn Island. And there is Pitcairn Island. It's about a little less than three square miles, two and three quarter square miles. About 8% of it is called flat. I don't think it's flat. Uh, I've seen the schoolyard there and uh, tried to calculate how many balls in the last hundred years have gone into the Pacific Ocean because it's uh, schoolyard slants like this. That's flat. So there are caves where you can hide and you see the shore. There's no real beach. So it would be a real hard place to get into. And here's the entire story, which is going around uh, the room there. And this is the one that I wrote that was published in 2008. And I think it's a pretty good book. And here's uh, Bounty Bay on Pitcairn Island. Barbara and I uh, rode in there. I don't think I've ever been so seasick in my life. It's really treacherous. And the only way you get in is a Pitcairn men bring you in in their own launches. Pitcairn Navy consists of two launches called Tin and Tub, which is description enough. But we did get in, and then you have to go up the hill of difficulty, and you can imagine why it's called that, about a quarter of a mile straight up, and you get to the village. The only town there is Adams Town. We'll see that. Pitcairn had at one time been inhabited maybe up to uh, about 1450 A.D. It had supplied uh, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain types of stones for adzes, which are tools, to the people of Mangareva. So they had a colony there, maybe 100 people. There were petroglyphs, which is to say rock pictures carved on the rocks. There were still some uh, uh, umus, which are the, uh, where they cook, and uh, few artifacts, few artifacts now, and some tikis, which are uh, statues of gods. So the mutineers, being very pious, good Christians, uh, threw the uh, statues into the water. But these people were gone, so this is a pretty good place. In fact, the more I think about it, and Barbara and I have been in the Pacific many times, we've been in many, many allied groups, I can't think of a better place. This was the only really good place to go hide out where they're not going to get found. And they're not going to get found for 18 years. And then nothing happens to them. Here's a map of Pitcairn. It's interesting about all the places on the map, places like where John Fall, where Nancy topple off, and places like that near the coast. So people were always falling in. And. Uh, during the next uh, 10 years, from 1790 when they landed in January until 1800, uh, the native men, the Tahitian men they brought with them, killed uh, several of the, including Fletcher Christian, several of the, uh, killed six, killed uh, five of the uh, mutineers. Two of them uh, were killed by other mutineers, that leaves two. One of them died of natural causes, 
The only one left was John Adams, who had been raised in an orphanage in East London, uh, was illiterate but had learned to read uh, because the last other last remaining mutineer taught him how to read. He became a good Christian and he Christianized the young people of the island because now we got something like 18 little kids and uh, the uh, women uh, and the women of the island. Uh, so uh, we've got nine women, a couple of guys. We've got about seven women, a bunch of little kids, and they all go to church. Adams holds the church services. And finally, in, 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 here's the firstborn son of Fletcher Christian. And Fletcher, with his uh, uh, sense of humor, named him uh, Thursday, October. So uh, in 1808, a ship, uh, Captain Folger, uh, uh, came and of uh, the Topaz, a whaling ship from America, mm -hmm. came and actually found the island. He came ashore and <coughs> met Thursday October Christian. He says, what's your name? He says, Thursday October Christian. And uh, Folger explains because of the international date line that he was actually born on Friday. The guy becomes really flustered, changes his name to Friday October. <laughs> but everybody still calls him Thursday, so he changes it back. That's, that's not too important, but, uh, but it happened. And uh, here's a, a typical house on Pitcairn Allen. Very neat English, as, as much as they could make it English style rather than Tahitian style. Uh, people spoke English. They read and wrote. They were quite civilized. And George Hunt Nobbs came in 1828, extremely well educated, became the pastor of their church and the school teacher. And I've read letters written by some of the people during that period, extremely literate, as literate as anybody in our own school, well, no, better than our, some of our own schools. Here's a bit Karen home. And then, in 1838, comes this man, Joshua Hill, from England. Nobody had ever heard of him. Six foot tall, about 60 years old. And he had written letters to the British government, please put me in charge of the uh, of Pitcairn Island. And they had never agreed to that. But he brought his letters, and he came ashore, and he said, I've been appointed as your commander in chief and your captain, and uh, here I am. He disarmed the people. He broke up the stills where they were making liquor. He kicked off the three Englishmen who had, including Nobbs, who had come on passing ships and became the dictator of Pitcairn Island for two years. And he explained to the people, he says, I'm the cousin of the Duke of Bedford and I uh, know, uh, I knew Josephine Bonaparte, I, I know the King of England and all that. And I'm the cousin of the Duke of Bedford. All of that was fine until the HMS Actian came a couple of years later, commanded by the son of the Duke of Bedford. I've never heard of this dude. So they threw him off. But they shook up the people of Pitcairn so much, they asked the next passing captain of the British ship, will you please write a constitution for us and protect us? And he said, yes, I will. So from 1838 onward, Pitcairn has been a British colony still is today, one of 14 British colonies left, the one with the second smallest population. I don't know whether it's about 35. What's the smallest population? British Antarctica. So in 1856, they became so populous, the government moved them all off to Norfolk Island, which is uh, about 500 miles off the coast, 300 miles off the coast of Australia. It had been a prison colony, therefore all these wonderful buildings. Many of their descendants are still there today. So you'll find Christians and Youngs and Warrens and others there today. But within the next few years, some of them got homesick, led by Moses Young and his brother Mayhu, who brought back uh, 16 people to Pitcairn. And from there, coming back, the descendants are still there today.
Here's the pit carrying school. That's the playground. See what I mean by the balls rolling into the Pacific? They didn't even have a fence down there. Uh, who's the school teacher? Usually the school teacher comes for a couple of years and uh, is also maybe the nurse. And uh, uh, so they do have a school. And here's downtown Pitt Karen. There's the, there's the post office and the courthouse. And we had a uh, lunch in the courthouse when, when we came. And the administrator's office. So that's Adams Town, downtown Pitt Karen. Population today about 35. Highest population, 1937, 233. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. That was a lot at that time, yeah. Well, when Barbara and I went in 1986, we thought, these are the most wonderful people we've ever met. They're like our relatives. We love them. And uh, we want to go back and see them. We wish them well. And then we found out that for 40 years, there had been sexual abuses on the island. And men of the island were initiating, so to speak, uh, read rape into that, the young women. And some of the young women were actually, you know, like, it's okay because this is what we do. And the men said, well, we're Polynesians, we're not British. But they were British because according to British law, the people of these 14 colonies that are left, 14 small places, are British citizens. So when a uh, magistrate came out from Kent uh, Police Department to investigate another matter entirely, Somebody told her about these rapes, and she had to report it back. So what they did was they put six men, I'm only talking about 30 some odd men on the island, six of the nine men on trial for sexual abuse. And while, uh, and so they had to send for judges who came out in their uh, wigs, you know, from England or from uh, New Zealand, and they had to send for defense attorneys, all kinds of uh, newspaper reporters came. This was a very, very big deal. While they were waiting for the judges and all these people to arrive to set up the court, the uh, accused themselves were paid $5 an hour to build a prison. I mean, who else is going to do it? And uh, five of the six were uh, yeah, no, seven out of eight. I guess seven out of eight were actually convicted. The eighth one was exonerated entirely and they made him the mayor. <laughs> Here's a picture of Pitt Karen. They have some nice, nice homes there today. And here's the people of Pitt Karen who come out to one of the cruise ships and they're saying goodbye to us. And when they come out, they sing in the sweet <coughs> by and by, and all the passengers cry because they're leaving the care and they're such sweet people, except, of course, for the rapists. And here's the back cover of my book, available on Amazon.com. <laughs> so, not ask a question while I was talking, but now I'm ready for your questions. Um, yes, sir. Were there any, any animal population or? Was there any animal population on the island? None that I know of. I think some, maybe some rats. Oh. That was about it. But uh, they themselves brought some pigs and some chickens with them. Oh. And all of that was fine until 1790 when they were, uh, converted to Seventh-day Adventism. They're vegetarian. Because they're, vegetari they're vegetarians. No, yeah, I was going to say, they're Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. so Adventists are vegetarians. They don't drink and they don't smoke. So they're a pretty healthy group of people. But, 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 that having been said, when we were there in 1986, the captain gave some of the men uh, who had rowed us in on their boats uh, a couple of cases of beer. Well, how does that work for an Adventist? Well, William Buckley, the conservative columnist who was also a lecturer to Pitcairn Island, said, the Pitcairn Islanders, being Seventh-day Adventists, never take a drink. Unless, of course, one is offered to. <laughs> <laughs> yes? 
you're going to write another book about Captain Bly's voyage? Am I going to write a book about Captain Bly's voyage? That's been done. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do uh, next, but uh, uh, I'm happy when I'm writing, so probably something. Have you been asked to uh, advise them on ma making the movies? Uh, Have I been asked to? Oh, advise to making the movies? Uh, yeah, they said, please stay off the lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had no. Uh, Nobody's asked me. Hey, I, I thought for sure I'd get on PPS or something like that. Who's the greatest authority on that subject? But yeah. Nobody's asked yeah, me. They don't want to know that. Nobel Prize doesn't call. Uh, PPS doesn't call. Nobody calls. But yeah. I'm going to be on TV today, so that's good. Yes. The uh, the others that were transported and didn't return. Did you see the island was uh, North? Norfolk. Oh, Norfolk. In, in uh, 1856, the whole population, which was 126, I think, at the time, went to Norfolk Island. Oh. And uh, 16 returned in the next six years. The rest of them are there. And, are, they, and they're still there. They're still there. And kind of an interesting story about this. One of the uh, passing sailors who had come in the very early years, I think about 1810 or so, was a man named John Buffett. And of course, there are tons of Buffets today on uh, Norfolk Island. There's none on uh, Big Heron. So a few years ago, uh, Warren Buffett, you know, the millionaire, mm -hmm. his yeah. sister uh, called Jimmy Buffett, the singer, and said, are we a relation? He said, I don't think so. And the two of them went off to Norfolk Island to find more Buffets. And there they found tons of Buffets, but they were Unable to, although they all claim to be close to close relatives of Warren's, <laughs> uh, they didn't yeah, establish so a relationship. So yeah, if you go to uh, uh, <clears throat> go there today, there's lots and lots of descendants of the Muir. So have they? Are they staying kind of inclusive, or are they mixed with? No, them? no. There's a lot of other people who have gone to Norfolk Island as well. A lot of Australians. I forget what the proportion is maybe about 40% uh, descendants of the mutineers and the rest of them other people. Uh, a lot of Pitcairners, or a lot of, yeah, Pitcairners and Norfolkers have gone to Australia, to New Zealand. A few have been in America. I met uh, a couple over in England uh, last August. Uh -huh. So they travel around. They're well-traveled people. But the and people in Pitcairn have just really stayed inclusive. People in Pitcairn have stayed pretty inclusive with some, uh, with a few people coming in from time to time, and, and uh, like you said, a nurse. And yeah, and a uh, few people will come in and intermarry with them. A study was done a while back that showed there's no real, really no uh, genetic disability from any of this, okay. although they're they're strongly related. So the intermarriage hasn't created too no, many people. No, <laughs> no, some of them are not terribly bright, but we have. Uh, not in Petaluma, but I'm in mean other places. <laughs> yes. Are you aware that the author Colleen McCulloch, um, author of The Thought Birds, is married to one of the descendants? What's her Fletcher name? Christian. Oh, Colleen, Colleen McCulloch, oh. who oh, wrote no, The Thought Birds, yes. And she Colleen. lives, uh, well, she's actually back in Sydney now, but she lived on Norfolk Island for many years I with did. one of the descendants. I did not yeah. know that, thank mm. you. Anything else? Uh, yes. How is it that Angwin has a Pitcairn Study Center? How is it that Angwin has a Pitcairn Study Center? Because uh, they're Seventh day Adventists, and uh, there was a uh, college, it was called Healdsburg College, that was uh, founded, oh, sorry, I don't know, 1870s, uh, by the Seventh day Adventists. And then later on, they moved to Angwin and founded Pacific Union College. college. One of the professors up there, a man named Herbert Ford, became just fascinated with the story of Pitcairn. And he got permission to have a room in the library there to start a Pitcairn library. Well, now they have a small suite of rooms, and they have the largest collection of Pitcairn material uh, probably in the world. And it was, it was wonderful for me to be able to go over there and find all this material. So this I is thought, uh, here. Yeah, yeah, Angwin over, over above Saint Helena, yeah. 
And I thought, since I've been there twice, I have some credibility. I have a PhD. I'm interested. The library's there. Jeez, it would be... Uh, you better write a book. Yeah, it'd be a shame if I didn't. So, <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you very... Oh, yes, sir. Well, I thought that uh, the founder was Kellogg, who uh, was oh, the serial... Uh, well, that's a 70 Adventism. No, come on. You want to know about 70 Adventism? In 1844, there was a man named William Miller who said the world was coming to an end on October 22nd. And uh, all of his followers, called Millerites, didn't plant, slaughtered their animals, gave away their wealth, and waited for the world to get uh, Well, the world didn't. So uh, they were disappointed. He thought about it for a while, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. He says, I had the right date, the wrong event. Uh, <laughs> it's that day that Christ has begun to plan for the end of the world. So a lot of people dropped out from that. But later on, uh, Ellen White uh, was a lady who organized the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 1870s. And it's still with us today. As far as Kellogg went, I get a, a Kellogg cornflakes and all that. I know that he was a vegetarian health food advocate. Whether he was actually an dentist, I, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming. Uh, please check out my website, uh, www.historyconnect.net. Uh, there's a couple cards up there if you're, we got always great speakers and great things coming up. So again, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank coming. you very thank much. You. Thank you. Here, this is my book at Karen Island, The Bounty Mutineers and Their Descendants. And I am the author, Robert W. Kirk. Thank you.